again, been a bit of a while. So this is our November session. I'm very grateful for Dr. Pablo, who's a very distinguished academic. I've been getting to know his work in the last few weeks. Um, really, we're going to look at this idea of management as a science and art or a practice. What are some of the things that HR managers in particular, managers generally can do to think through what are some of the weak signals that may be coming within the organization, how we can read through some of those, perhaps where and how to de detect early warning signs and looking at case studies and some of work around where that hasn't happened, some of the consequences around that. So really to start thinking through what is it post COVID, and that's been our theme with all of our speakers from Bob Kellner onwards, really to start thinking about what is it in post COVID where companies where we've established a position where often they're having less staff, less in the way of incentives and payments. And one thing we're gonna look at is incentives as well and aligning incentives to what you really want, getting the desired behaviors. But so less staff, less incentives and more risk to the business. So that's our post-COVID environment. But I think some of the lessons learned that I've certainly been exploring the last few weeks with it were very important, very relevant. So um, if I could ask you to just have a little drink, that's always the way with it. We start a couple, I'll catch you at the very moment you're about to drink. That's so, right. Right, so thank you very much for having us on behalf of uh, Kata HR Forum and our members and the organizational development company who sponsor our work. Okay, so very thank you very much for being here. Well, me being here, letting me into your office to be able to join us this evening. So perhaps if we could just kick off a little bit of me to welcome you to Kata. You've been here now for about a year, right? A little shy of a year. Yes. Okay. And how are you find it? Well, so far so good. I mean, I've been to Qatar before, so it's not, it wasn't my first time. Although the first time I came, there was only the uh, the share of them, so I mean, it's changed a lot since. Right. Um, of course, I came in December. The first few weeks, you get tried to get adjusted, and of course, we had COVID, and that was a big disruption, like it was for everybody. So we had to adjust to that. But other than that, I mean, it's, uh, it's not that big. Right. Great. I'm glad you're enjoying it. So an interesting first year anyway. You arrived. And within two months, you're hit with a COVID crisis. So your business has had to adapt. You've had to think slightly differently and perhaps reappraise some of the systems and procedures that you've got here, just as any other businesses, right? So we're starting to think through. So one of the things I wanted to talk about was this idea of early warning signals. So some of your work sort of talks about how we don't recognize them. So some of the companies we looked at in terms of Nokia and Wirecard and BlackBerry, uh, they're obviously tough on companies that are doing very well. What are some of the oil, early warning signals that we're seeing in oil and gas? Cut is obviously very oil and gas dependent. Um, I mean, it's, uh, it, it's difficult. I mean, I, I'm, remember, I'm, I'm focusing on the on the signals. I don't necessarily know what the signals are because no. they, they're different from industry. But what I, I think we can give the message like that I can give to managers is that the, if, if, you, if you have expertise in the industry, you can teach yourself how to detect some few things that are like what's happening in the uh, things only catch you by surprise uh, because they are they, they're really random or because you're unprepared. There are two reasons there. Uh, what I'm saying is that if you focus on oil and gas, we, we see the technological transition. Uh, we see that there is a technological change. Now, COVID may have accelerated the transition uh, to a, a cleaner world. Uh, also, there may be a less demand for travel. In any case, I mean, we see that there's significant push for uh, ways to generate electricity. Uh, and uh, maybe lower dependent on, on hydrocarbons. Mm -hmm. So I will, I will look into those things. Now, the, the industry is a very, um, it's a very interesting industry. Um, they haven't made like significant, like radical technological changes over the past few years. There are a few that are quite impressive. Uh, fracking also caught the industry by surprise a little bit. I mean, mm -hmm. how, how cheap uh, uh, fracking was going to become. I remember when I, I was in the province of Alberta in Canada, with a professor oh, there. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, well, there the the it was the early stages of fracking, and uh, fracking was only viable if the price of barrel of oil was I can't remember the time, I think it was forty dollars or fifty dollars. So in any case, I mean, many people were reassured that you couldn't compete with fracking. Uh, fracking would not be able to compete with you. And then um, the technology got a lot better, and the cost went down. And now, next thing you know, the U.S. is an exporter of oil, mm -hmm. supposed to be an importer. Uh, so you know, the, the important thing is to pay attention to the things that are happening out there. Not every signal becomes a threat, but I mean, at least you, you need to be aware. And we, we often like, we, we get used to the things that we do every day and we forget that things could be different. And in some cases, there's no reason why they're not different. 
Well, it's interesting, because we're starting to delve into the realm of risk management here. And that idea that we get very comfortable and we get used to doing things and we do things in a certain way, that we go back to that thing around the fracking, what we saw was actually it crept up. People had known about fracking for a long time. I remember talking to colleagues here who were working in the oil and gas and very aware of it, of course, watching it, but actually didn't think it would happen to them, right? In the same way, last time we had a, we had a very interesting discussion setting this up and Dr. Pablo was talking about the idea of risks are often ignored if not experienced before. And um, it got me thinking, well, if you gave the example of death, right? So we do, we haven't experienced it. We often ignore the risk of that and that possibility. And I got to thinking about some of the things that I've been reading of yours and a few other things. And this idea of ignoring risk. And then suddenly the, the industry, the oil and gas industry, had to go into a price war and drop the price of oil and gas, the price of a barrel of oil, so that it could make fracking unviable. That was the end in the end. Yeah, you, you're right. I mean, we, we, um, we're not very good at estimating risk. Mm. Human beings are not. I mean, we have tools that make it a little bit better, but still, this is not something we do very well. Mm. We are particularly bad with things that cannot we cannot really assess, things we have no experience, because, well, I mean, how would you measure the risk of something that doesn't really exist? It takes a, uh, some kind of like high-level abstraction. Uh, but when I hear uh, of the price war in the oil industry or the airline industry, I always wonder, well, how did that happen? I mean, turns out in the airline industry, well, price war because there are too many seats and not enough passengers. The seats don't appear like magic. Someone buys the planes, uh, someone buys the seats, someone expands. The same with the oil and gas industry. When you when you have overcapacity, well, then someone uh, drill, uh, some clear the infrastructure, so they're not as surprising as they look, all right? Now, the, if you follow the industry, you realize there's some trends and some things are happening. The important thing is not to not focus on the oil and gas. The general mm. important thing is that to question your uh, on a regular basis what's going on, what is normal, mm. and see uh, how things can go in a different way. And there are many tools that many of, uh, of your uh, viewers probably know, the red teaming tool, in which you, uh, you empower a team to actually tell you where things are going to go wrong. They're not wishing you for things to go wrong, but they can see things that you don't do because once you uh, focus on success, you want that success to happen. Mm. So you tend to forget the, the bad things because you engage into that. And that's mm. a good thing. It's not bad at all. On the other hand, you want someone who can actually point to the things that you're not likely to see. Mm. And that's an interesting point there about the idea of red teaming. So empowering a small team within an organization to look, to put on the black hat, if you were to use Edward de Bono's idea, the hats, to put that on and say, I'm going to be the black hatter and I'm going to look for everything that's wrong with this. So that we can start to mitigate risk, not just with the risk department, because I think sometimes that can be an issue as well, where it seems it's not my problem. It's their team, they're the risk management team. It's not a shared issue for us. I mean, risk management is a little like, a, like a ethics or, uh, or compliance. I mean, there's not something the compliance department do, the ethics department, everybody has to do it, right? No. Uh, it's, it's, it's supposed to be longitudinal. So mm. everybody in the organization should be assessing risk and trying to minimize them, mm. at least understanding what they are so the experts can uh, come and help. Um, we don't do that very often. We, 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 we tend to do patterns. Let me put this with uh, the, the way we started the conversation. We mm. said that this management uh, is managing the science, it's managing an, an art. Well, maybe it's a combination of both, but it's certainly a practice. And uh, uh, this is good in a sense, because for a long time, we believed that to be a good manager, uh, you needed a gift uh, you need mm. to be born with. Now, if that's a gift, it means that there's very little I can do to get the gift. If we're not born with a gift, well, that's it. You don't have it. What can you do? Now, we know today, or we believe today, that people are born with gifts. People have some skills that make them better than others. But anyone can improve because management is a practice. It's something you do. And the more, more often you do something, well, the better you get at that. There is one problem with that. This is good in the sense that management can be learned. The problem is that uh, we uh, human beings, we like uh, routines. We love predictability. So we tend to do things in a certain way because that's the way we did it. In fact, most of our, our behavior it's pretty patterned, mm. uh, but sometimes we're not aware of the patterns. So the, the problem is precisely that, is that you're trying to uh, assess the, 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 the risk of something that has never existed with a pattern that already exists. And that is, this mismatch is common. Mm. That's why you need to be alert to the, to the weak signals. Uh, you need to, need to have someone in the company who understands what they are, who puts them on the table, and you discuss that. All the way from the managers, the line managers, the, the, the business unit managers, the CEO and his or her team, and of course, the board of directors. Everybody should be able to assess this. Mm. And so, I mean, one of the things I picked up in your work that I found quite interesting was this idea of conditional probability. 
Do you want to just expand a little bit and define that and share that with yeah, our we, listen, We're not very good at probability. We are not very good at what they are. So if something it has outcomes, we tend to believe that because you have two outcomes, well, the probability should be 50 50. And the example I gave in, in a lecture uh, I did before is that uh, let's, let's talk about football, soccer, uh, and there is a penalty. Well, the penalty can end in two ways. Either the goal is scored or it's not scored. There's not many more than that, right? This is pretty much uh, covers all the possibilities. Right. Now, if you have Messi shooting the, the, the penalty or Cristiano Ronaldo, that's uh, the, the soccer player you prefer, uh, what are the chances he's going to score a goal? Well, we can say, hey, there are two probable possibilities, then the chances are 50 minutes. No, that's not the case. If you look at the history of Cristiano Ronaldo, he has scored about 84% of the shoots he takes. Now, it's not perfect. But it's really good. So it's out of, I, out of 10, four out of five. So if you have to take a bet, let's say that one take a bet, chances are on the yes or on the no, even right. though the outcome is uh, is the dual. Now, the, the question of professional field is certainly happen only because things can happen or have not happened before. And we, we tend to, to, to forget very rapidly that this has, has a chain of, of events. Now, the, the example here, we all live with that, especially here in Doha. If you go to a supermarket anywhere, they check your temperature and they want to see if your temperature is over 38. Now, is it conceivable that you can have COVID if your temperature is below 38? Yeah, yeah it is possible, but it's a lot less likely. The same thing if your temperature is above 38. What are the chances of having COVID given that your temperature is above 38, a lot bigger than below 38? But that, those are two things, those conditions, they, they happen in sequence. So the idea is understanding that sometimes the sequence of events need to certain out outcomes and that we need to understand how this chain works. It's very useful, it's very useful for managers. But it's not that the most important thing is to see things in terms of probability. How likely is it? And so it sort of brings me to the idea, we've got a lot of HR members at a HR forum, we tend to have that. So we've got managers in there. It brings me to this idea of incentives. So if we're beginning to see the trend and we, we want to incentivize certain behaviors and certain thinking, particularly the idea that we might be doing things that are against the grain within the company, because we want to be the black hatter. We want to say, hang on a minute, there's something not right here. I know they're doing very well. They're bringing great profits in. We take Blockbuster video, for example, and we do, and then this, this digital thing occurring, but we're doing very, we're doing fine with our rental business. We're all incentivized on the number of rentals we've got. How do you go about changing some of that? Some examples you might think of? Well, the, the, I think the, the, there are many stages here, but the first one is to be aware of what's going on. One of the most famous articles in the uh, discipline of management that we study and we teach uh, our MBA students and students that come to our classrooms is an article that says, Because if not, people are going to do what the incentives tell them to do. All right. That, that's that's a very big one. So my experience, again, limited and personal, but I think I know a few companies, is that there is a, there is a significant misalignment in many companies. You want something and you reward something else. So right there, is there a misalignment? If, if there is a misalignment, people are not doing what you think they should do because you're incentivizing not to do it. Mm. So it's more your fault than their fault. The second thing is that there's never a perfect alignment between the company and the person. Right. I mean, it can be a good alignment, but never a perfect alignment because the person can either get a new job, right? And the company can get a new employee if you want. 
So they often, the job of the manager, HR, but not just HR, everybody is trying to make sure that the incentives and the interests of these two entities are as close as possible. Mm. Now we have any examples in the past of CEOs who are incentivized to maximize the return in the short term, because in the long term, you ought to be there. So who cares? Uh, well, I, mean, I don't like that attitude, but some people do that. If you re reward people for behavior that's going to mature from here to December, well, expect them to be focused on things that happen from here to December. So the idea is that how do you reconcile the interest? And there are many tools, I'm not going to get into the tools, but there are many tools that HR managers can uh, suggest. So there is a better alignment between the interest of the person and the interest of the organization, not just in terms in general, but also in terms of time. Well, it's interesting in terms of that timeline because I think one of the things is organizations need to think long term, but they need to manage at this particular moment of pandemic, a very short term harding issue affecting business models, but it's affecting the way that we operate in our environment. Yet we've still got that long term goal, that long term strategic plan. And I think for me, aligning KPIs is something that we really do need to think about how performance management systems support a higher level long-term thinking, but also manage short-term high speed. Any thoughts around that idea around alignment KPIs and making sure that there isn't that mismatch? Well, there, there are two. I mean, what we see, uh, one of the things that the pandemic, uh, the pandemic gave us as a lesson is that uh, companies tend to have technologies that don't use very well. All right. So it turns out that it took a pandemic for every single one of us to move to Zoom and to Teams, but we already have Teams. Teams was a part of Microsoft and the window was pretty much used by anybody. So how come it took a pandemic? Mm. How come we didn't discover the beauties of doing this before? The second thing is that most companies, and again, this is not a, I mean, this is not a criticism, but it's an observation. Most companies, they have a lot of slack. They have a lot of room to improve. So I guess the pandemic taught, taught us that there is a technology that can, we can use, some technologies we can deploy, that open the technology and deploy the technology are two different things. And also that there may be there are productivity pockets that you can take. Right? Now, having said that, and, and now I'll go to the, uh, the, the counterpoint, uh, in, in times of crisis, we need to be very careful of not to do strategy by budgetary cuts. Okay. Now, the, the consequences of cuts can be felt in a long time. You need to make sure never you make a cut out. Uh, if in six months' time the situation changes, well, you've got what, what you want. There is a company, a um, um, large organization I'm, I'm surrounded with, and this organization decided to make a budgetary cut of X percent. Doesn't matter how much it is, but it's an X percent. So they had many business units. They told every business unit you cut by X percent, X being the same for all the business units. Mm -hmm. But we know, and you and I know, and the, the, the viewers know too, that certain things you cut X percent and they don't make a difference. You just keep going the same. And certain things you cut X percent and you stop, they stop. Yeah. So make sure that the ones that keep going are the ones you want to keep going because one day we'll go back to a new normal. And that day, well, the one you shut down will not be there anymore. And they won't take you 20%, will take you a lot more to start up yeah. because it's easy to stop than to start. So the idea is that if, even if you have a redu reduction in, uh, in income and you have difficulties, it's always important to make sure that you do reductions with, uh, with management in mind. With the, the, with the understanding that these things, well, they can affect your, your behavior after when we go back to the back to normal. So we have a brain to the decision. I think that's something, again, those of us who had to be involved or aware of the way that we've been doing some post pandemic cuts in organizations, a 30% cut across the board equally. And that might sound equitable, but actually it's about looking at where that needs to be. Maybe we can't afford to cut anything in one department and we can get a to cut 50% somewhere else. And I think balancing is something very important here. Uh, yeah, the, the, you know, if there is a crisis, you need to start, you need to start uh, reconsidering what's important to you. Yeah. Now, you cannot pretend that cutting 30% and everything is going to be exactly the same as it was before. There is a pandemic, you need to change, your business is going to be redeveloped. So what do you need to do right now? Things are important to do now. But again, you need a brain when you do budgetary cuts because yeah. they do shape the organization. And that is, uh, that can be, that can be. All right. Apologies, I'm just sending a message to our friend Sharon to try and do something about the sound. So if you are hearing a little bit of a sound in the background, apologies for that. I don't know where that's come from, but I think they know in England we call that sod law. The very time that you would want yeah, not exactly. want something to happen. It's been quiet all day. Well, this is a skyscraper, so right. I really don't do any work here, except for, for today. Right now, as we're doing it. So I've just sent a little message, so apologies for that. Um, so really going back to that thing here. I mean, I'm thinking about longer term horizons. So one 
we talked about reshaping the business to manage the pandemic, thinking and working with boards and CEOs, the C-suite to actually get them to move beyond a 30% cut across all departments. The other thing is about perhaps an idea that I saw in some of your work about recognizing recovery windows. So where we've had a weak signal, we've now had some, a situation that might have accelerated something, um, pandemic in this case, they accelerated certain ways that we work. So I think if you take the oil and gas industry, there was a bizarre situation at some point in the last year or so where people were being paid to receive oil because the pandemic would reduce supply, supply so much, the supply depots were had the contracts, they were due to the delivery, and they simply couldn't receive it. So you could get paid to receive a ballot of oil, let alone the companies were paid for giving away oil. I think up to one percent to minus thirty dollars, right? So we had a very interesting situation that was sort of it was contracts, it was futures, so it was planned. You could see that happening. Now, how are we going to start thinking about this idea really about recovery windows? Because that was uh, something I found very interesting. Here. Well, recovery windows. I mean, and, and I, I use the term and I didn't create the term, but it's a very interesting concept. Mm. The idea that certain things uh, can be covered during a certain time. Uh, just like when we talk about opportunity windows over here. Turn the volume up as well. Yeah. <laughs> so, so sure. you, have, you, have that, you have that moment, right? You have that moment in which you can recover. Certain things you can fix until they get to the ground. The, the joke is uh, about the, um, the, 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 the very old joke, the Fortes too, but the guy who actually jumped from the last, the last floor of the Eiffel Tower and yeah. he goes to the second floor and I say, how are you doing? It's so far so good. Yeah, but, <laughs> yeah, it doesn't look good I mean, in the near term. Right. So the idea is that the, the, the idea of having recovery windows is that you have the possibility of understanding what are the things I can do now mm -hmm. to prevent a major disaster. Because at a certain point, if there's, there's a threshold, and once the threshold is crossed, well, you can't undo that. So the, the, those, the, there, there's two things that are connected. You want to be as alert to the signals of uh, that deteriorating environments, things like the technologies are changing, things are things that signals that things are not going to be exactly the way that were in the past, that they're going to be different. And then you want to be able to do that in the time that allows you to take action. But experimenting is the way to go. I mean, when, when you say the um, people were getting paid to, to actually uh, receive oil, it reminds me of the year 2008. We had a financial crisis and the shipping was free. You could ship a container from China to, uh, to, well, to the US for free. You had to pay the taxes because again, the, the ship, had, they had to move and so on and so forth. Uh, so it's not like completely something that never happened before. Maybe it didn't happen in the oil industry, but it happened in different industries. So when you have a recovery, well, what do you do? Well, in some industry where continuous process, there's nothing you can do. You have to keep producing. In some others, you have time to adjust. The point here is understand that the weak signal may produce results that are desirable, and that you have a certain time to put certain things in motion at the very least to prepare. Uh, the, once you cross the threshold, then no action is possible. And that's the beauty of understanding what the recovery window is for a specific situation. It's protection, right? Yeah. Ultimately, it's pre-prevention is what we're really thinking through. So, I mean, I think I want to just talk about this idea of performance management to fit in with that, because if we were to have a weak signal and we saw that we need to incentivize certain behaviors that would help us recover or prevent something happening on there. I mean, I think, you know, you've, you've alluded to the 2008 global financial crisis is something that, you know, Qatar has spent a lot of, it's got a big financial sector here. So it's a big focus for this area and for a lot of our members in there. What we saw at that point would be people being incentivized for very short decisions in the US market, for example, selling mortgages, selling debt onto households, that they knew, that everybody knew, that actually they couldn't service that debt a long time. Or had that, you know, the theory of the greater fool that is just passing down the chain from one organization to another. And then we had credit default swaps and all sorts of complicated financial instruments that, with hindsight, it's very easy to say they were never going to work. And they were having on institutional level, right the way through to a country like Iceland buying it up, or local authorities in the UK investing pensioners' money into things that didn't work. Right? So, how do we go about, in particular, do you think, incentivizing a slightly longer term view within? Major players such as the finance industry. And in, in that case, it was systemic. If we talk about 2008, it was a systemic problem. And the idea was that they knew these things were toxic. They knew they were going to blow. The only thing that they didn't want is that they didn't blow in your hands. So the idea was passing on to someone else. So uh, obviously, there's a systemic problem there. But the, uh, let, let's go back to the idea of incentives. You want to align the incentives. You want to make sure that you 
say you, you have very, very clear understanding of what you want, right? Um, uh, now, all co different companies have different priorities, different industries have different priorities, but if you want certain behavior, there are certain things you have to do. Uh, for example, in the oil and gas industry, it's particularly good with safety and security, but right. the consequence of mistake are huge, so they do that very, very well. So you need, I, I think you say, if you're focusing on oil and gas, you could ask yourself, what are the things that we do in safety and security that we could do in other parts of the business if we want this type of compliance and this type of alignment? Mm. Uh, my, my interaction with people from the oil and gas industry, they all take safety and security very seriously. Yeah, well, how come there are a lot of other things that take seriously? Right. So what do you, what does it take for you to actually have this seriousness, this culture of safety, security, compliance, following the rules? What does it take to actually take that to another dimension of the organization that you, you want to decide? Mm. And uh, of course, I mean, we can do everything because our time is limited. So that is, that is the thinking you should have. Now, same thing when you're in, you're in, the, um, in the banking industry. So what are the, the behaviors that you think are good? I mean, how can you replicate those behaviors? Mm. So even for asset managers, we want to think where, I mean, one of the things that I've seen work quite well is where we're incentivized to over a 12 month period rather than per deal. So your bonuses are going to come in maybe one or even two years down the line. We can deal with that works over the time. And now we're seeing, interestingly enough, this idea of ESG. So the UK have just issued their first, I think we need that. But what we're seeing is that actually using the power of finance to manage risk in terms of, say, climate change, for example, because we're all in trouble with climate change, every industry and every one of us. Now, some of your experience in say, I was thinking in terms of Canada, where we've got quite a beautiful, rich natural environment and some of the dirtiest coal tar fracking that we can think of. How do you manage that together? Uh, and how well, is it perceived politically as well as economically? The, the, uh, the way is that the, the political power is, is divided in different ways in Canada. You have problems are quite powerful, just like the state of the US. Right. So it turns out that people who are like pro fracking and pro uh, extraction and not particularly sensitive to the environment are in the province with the have the old times. Mm -hmm. uh, the rest are more sensitive, but they are in parts who don't have it. So there is uh, also again, tension in the country, in different parts of the country and so forth. Uh, the, the, the point, the, the point of, uh, of um, managers paying attention to things that matter to them mm. is a point that needs to be emphasized by all the companies. Uh, I think it's really essential for, uh, for, for getting the results you want. Now, the, the, uh, we have a short term horizon, human beings do, because we're not used to thinking about it for 20 years from now. Uh, so if on top of that, a company exacerbates that, that creates a big, uh, that creates a big, big problem. And in climate change, we're seeing it in, in the, the, same, the same way. I mean, we know what to do, we're not doing it. Uh, and we're not doing it because, well, you know what, it doesn't matter, I cannot make a difference. Uh, uh, it's so easy, it's a lot easier to go into the way of uh, not being conscious of your, um, of your carbon footprint and so forth. Also, it's systemic, and there's very little you can do. Uh, nevertheless, we are maybe getting to a point of uh, no return, and that could, be, that could be a problem for everybody, every single one of us. And I think that's interesting. So if we were to take that idea of the systemic risk, and we say, actually, in our companies, all of our companies, where we are, those, especially those involved with HR and these performance management systems, is that anywhere there, right? Is that a target somewhere along the line for every organization to think, what's our environmental footprint? And I would have a guess and say, no, in most companies that I sort of know of, we would, I, I don't know what it is in HEC Paris, but I certainly know other places that I know very well, they, they have really, they're not really considering some of those. So we see a bigger, less defined threat, but we do, as human beings, have organizations react very quickly to the immediate threat, that fight or flight for an organization that we've got there. So for managers, I think this idea of aligning KPIs and thinking long term, and then making sure that that cascades into performance management targets is absolutely fundamental yes. as a way of, of tackling that. Um, any examples you might want to share? Well, on? if you, you go to KPIs, I mean, we, we rely on, well, you mentioned the KPIs are short term and you have long term. And sometimes, of course, if you have two competing, the short term will take over. Hmm. We, we discussed that. The, uh, the, you can make better KPIs, but at the end of the KPIs are just metrics and they're imperfect, like anything else on earth. So I, I would suggest that you compensate these metrics with uh, other different type of metrics. So rather than taking the, trying to create a perfect KPI with a perfect metric, you can uh, use a different set of metrics. For example, a more human-made uh, uh, KPIs or mm -hmm. metrics. 
um, you can uh, 360 work very well right. uh, in, in terms of engagement. And the uh, survey of, of the people surrounding uh, the manager or the person of interest is quite useful again where the person is engaged, where the person is ethical, where the person is aligned with the long term interest of the company in a much better way than any KPI can do. So mm. KPIs are good, don't overdo them. Do right. not try to read too much into them. And maybe there are other ways to measure performance that are they use different tools. And that's why I think the, the, the HR manager should be encouraged. They, it's not just about numbers. Mm. There, there are other things, not, not exclusively numbers, there are other things. And they need to go beyond. What are the things we can measure to make sure the person's aligned? But can we make sure that to, to make sure the person is taking the advantage of the organization? Uh, but the, uh, the the misalignment, I think, is a source of many of the problems that we experience here. So misalignment in terms of we're being over-focused on numbers and measurement around there, not thinking around the 360 and holistic stuff around I mean, within the team. I mean, I, we may, many of us see it. I mean, we understand the problem, but when we look at our own KPIs, they're all like mostly based on financials and mostly based on the end of the year. So what what are you supposed to do? Mm. So it's very difficult to do different, right? right. So we've been incentivizing a certain thing. I mean, and, and there's obviously ways of gaming a system in terms of incentives. So I was listening to a podcast the other day um, on free economics that in the movie they talk about incentives. So we had an economist, so we had a small child who needed potty training. And what she was doing was actually the mum had been struggling, the child had been doing pretty well, she's like two and a half, using the potty, going to everything was going fine. Suddenly she stopped, she gets to about three, and she stopped using the potty very well. And the father being an economist says, well, I tell you what, I know what we've done. We've incentivized her wrongly. Okay, so we're looking for intrinsic motivation. Maybe at her age, she needs something extrinsic. Uh, extrinsic. So I know what she likes. She likes M&Ms. So what we do is every time she uses the potty, we'll give her a packet of M&Ms. And of course, within three days, he gives the example, she'd worked it out that she would say, okay, she'd go. And she developed incredibly good bladder control because she would go almost every 30 minutes and she would come back for the M&Ms. So they'd learn to game the system. And I think I use that as a sort of comic example, but we see that within organizations all the time, don't we? That we're actually, we, we engineer projects or things so that we can be seen to achieve a KPI or a performance management objective that perhaps isn't really what we should be doing. How are we incentivizing us to say, I tell you what, this is my performance management objective, but now I need to think differently and be able to change that. Have we got agile systems? Now, one of the things I've read about your work is something around this idea of processes and having slack within organizations. What are some of the things where you found that where things are over process driven? What's gone wrong with those? Can you give us an example of that? Oh, you mentioned the process and you mentioned the, the, the idea of slack. I think one of the things that happens on the, uh, the Kobe told us is that uh, if you're super tight, you have no more. Mm -hmm. So this idea of going for full efficiency may not be reasonable if the environment changes. Now, I'm not sure whether how, how much environment changes in different industries. Some industries are slower, some industries are faster. But if you're in an industry where there are technological changes, there are social changes, there may be, there may be affected by political changes, uh, there is competition from other places, well, maybe you need to incorporate some slack to the organization because efficiency is efficient about one very narrow thing. And when you structure the organization to do just one thing, do it very well and very efficiently, that's fantastic. But reconfigure to do something else becomes very, very complicated. Mm. So if the environment changes, you're not able to adjust very easily. The idea is that some slack can help, and slack not in the sense of, of waste, slack in the sense of letting people experiment. Mm. Uh, if people experiment, they have ideas, if they have a place to post their ideas, share their ideas in a psychological, um, uh, in a psychological so, safety zone, yeah. in a place where it's safe to, or to or manifest dissent and exchange ideas, well, that's how good ideas come about. And I think that's what they, that's what they do. So, okay, so we need to provide this, this place, psychological safety place, but also we provide the slack. If people are working eight hours a day, all the hours they have is something, then they're very unlikely to think about something new. Uh, and you need to have something new because you need to adapt because customers are changing, because markets are changing and so forth. If you focus too much on what you do, well, you, you miss the opportunities. Mm -hmm. And the example I think I was uh, citing to you is that uh, we, we have uh, last year was called the retail Armageddon in the US because so many retailers have gone under. 2020 is also horrible, but we have the COVID. Last year, we didn't have the COVID. And many of these retailers 
you say what went wrong, we'll tell you, oh, well, you know what, the prices of Amazon and uh, e-retail. But Amazon was printing in 96. So it's not a, definitely not a surprise. I mean, I'm not taking anything away from them. I'm yeah. saying they started with CDs. They moved to books. They had the book chains. They, they drove out of business. Now they started something else. And what took you so long? How come you didn't come up with new ideas? Now, maybe they didn't come up with new ideas because there aren't any. Uh, but, but they had time. It was not a surprise. So the idea is that how do you incentivize so people have ideas of what to do, I mean, how to behave, how to sell, uh, to whom? Uh, essentially, the whole marketing process, the whole operation process. And these people, they may be able to give you a new uh, idea for you as well, which is what you need environment change. Mm. So that, that idea of allowing experimentation, allowing a bit of use to come through as well. I mean, I was interested, I was doing a talk to uh, a company quite recently, and I used the example of Kodak, having a Kodak moment. Uh, half the table didn't know what I was talking about. So it's very old indeed. So that idea, some of you in there will remember what Kodak were. And as a child, you would develop your photos. You wouldn't get them on this. You would actually go to a chemist pharmacy, and you would have put in a reel of film, and then it was quite exciting. And it was, it was usually a pharmacy in England, it was Boots. You would go in there and you would receive a packet of these things. And your two film companies were as ubiquitous as McDonald's. We had Fuji and we had Kodak. So those were all the time around there. So I was talking about this idea of adapting business models and changes. And so I gave the example of Kodak. Well, everybody will get that. And this yeah, but the, you, you're talking about the media. Diversity. We call that moment is about the moment of life. Obviously, yeah. it was with us, but now with the younger generation, that happened. It will happen uh, for the rest of eternity, right? right? Until the uh, the end of uh, the end of time. Uh, that that brings the idea of diversity. Yeah. Now, the, the this uh, choice we to make. Now, uh, optimistic people say that every problem has a solution, and pessimistic say that every solution has a problem. <laughs> uh, let's let's talk on the pessimistic side. Now, if you have a team of very homogeneous people uh, who think the same. Uh, who have been trained in the same places, it doesn't matter whether men, women, or old, young, they, they all think the same because they all work to You get very good decision making, very rapid, but you, get, you lose diversity. Mm. So the, you get very sharp, very efficient, very to the point, but they all see the world in the same way. If you have like uh, some people, some uh, directors or some managers are women, some are men, some are young, some are old. Highly efficient, everybody's the same, you you crave for what you don't have, or vice versa. Yeah. What I'm saying is that you need to be aware of what you are and how to compensate. If you are you are you have a team of people who are tend to be group thinking, uh, they're all the same, they all train the same, have been around for a while, maybe what you need is a little more diversity and new ideas. So how what can you do to foster that? If you on the other hand, you have a very diverse, beautiful, diverse team, well, you need to put some order because the diverse team goes in all directions. It is to compensate, and that will add value. Because if you're really good at efficiency, another one percent is not going to make a huge difference. Right. But one percent of what you do really poorly makes a huge difference. And that also, since we're talking to HR managers, it goes also to the core of training. Mm. When you want to train a person, you say, "Well, what can you what can you learn?" And there's certain things that are not intuitive for the person. Those tend to add a lot of value. Right. So uh, uh, training. No Training non-intuitive things. Well, I mean, can I just take it back a little bit around there? That idea of diversity. I mean, I think what we're really talking about there is hiring for something. So, I mean, th th there's something to be done with our recruitment processes, looking through, thinking, looking at the teams that we've got, where um, are coming up, where there are new opportunities for people to think, are we bringing in this idea of group thing? Are we sort of reinforcing certain behaviors within an organization? And how do we change that? Perhaps 360s, perhaps identifying ways and traits and behaviors that we now recruit for rather than somebody who looks or sounds like me. Right. So what we get, we're trying to move away from from recruitment of each other, if you like. So that that's with the idea around group thing. And I think that's just something important to say when, because I think this conversation touches very much around recruitment policy as much as anything else. So in terms of learning. I think that's a very interesting idea of focusing on non-intuitive behaviors and trying to that. Well, behavior is easy. Maybe behavior is easy because it can be oh. modified. 
is our goal here. Okay, so but in any case, the combination, the, so the behavior you can always learn that unfortunately the traits are a lot more difficult. The idea is that you need to be aware of these things. And uh, as a general rule, again, I'm not talking about anyone specific here, but as a general rule, yeah, we don't pay enough attention uh, to recruitment. Uh, mm -hmm. We don't, we could do a lot a lot better than that. Uh, and if you see companies that are are we admire, they pay a lot of attention to to recruitment. Uh, they, they pay a lot of attention, a lot of interviews, because mm -hmm. once you have a person, it's a lot more complicated. Yeah, I mean, you can do all the training you want, but the, the training is going to start where the person is. If the person does not have the basics, well, now you're struggling to catch up. Right. And there's all kinds of consequences. So, would you pay a lot more attention to um, to um, to recruitment? Mm -hmm. And in particular, we need to look at what the good guys are doing. Now, always people always say, "Oh, Google hired this way." Yeah, but Google is Google. When they put a job for a, for an engineer, they get like ten thousand applications. Mm -hmm. We don't have that. But I mean, one of the things they say, and this is true, I mean, I don't look for experience, I look for skills. Uh, so that's an interesting way. What are the, the, the things this person will need to do? Mm. Uh, oh, well, there you go. Then you can see, do they have them? Do they, they look okay? What are the traits are needed for this behavior? What are the right. traits that can help you predict some of the behaviors? In any case, uh, there's a variety of things you can deploy to make sure that you do a better hiring. Because after that, it gets a lot more complicated. Right. So make things less complicated by hiring better. Questions coming through. Can you just um, ping them for me just to see and let me know because I'm, I can't do my usual of checking the usually on the screen. So the questions come of course, up yeah, and I'm able yeah. to do that. So I'm a little bit reliant on that. Um, and so as they come through, please do let me know. I mean, what I really want. So we've, we've, you've just started to talk around this idea of training or trait. I'm very interested. What do you mean by trait? And some of the th ideas that we might be able to manage around that. I mean, I'm not a psychologist, but if I understand correctly what I've been taught, there are certain things that you're born with, and those are traits and mm. the temperament, for example. Those that don't change. Uh, there is not very much you can do about that. This is the way you like, face life, if you want to call it that way. Yeah. Uh, on the other hand, personality was well, also shaped by your experiences, uh, yeah. but they're not, they're not traits. And you have behaviors which you can learn now. Uh, I, 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 what I did study a while ago was a leadership. What are the, the traits of a leader? Now, it will go back to the point I mentioned before. If you look for the traits of a leader, if you find them, well, if you don't have them, what do you do? Right. Uh, now we are focusing a lot more on the behaviors of the leader. And in general, the behaviors that lead to what we want, which is, in this particular case, not leadership, but a climate of um, psychological safety, of honesty. So what are, the, what are the traits that help to that? What are the behaviors that help you do that? And how can you learn behaviors uh, based on the traits? Right, so the behaviors based on the traits. Now, I mean, H is... Famous well, compensate, compensate because if you have a trait and you learn a behavior that emphasizes your trait, you're going to be weak at the other. Right. Maybe you can also learn a behavior that compensates for your trait. So, extrovert, this is one the classic example extroverts and introverts. Okay. Extroverts, they like to hang out with people, they're open to the world. Introverts, they have a rich world, but it's internal. Well, maybe it's useful for an introvert to learn how to be a little bit more extroverted. Now, it's not going to be intuitive, it's not going to be natural, mm -hmm. but it does a lot of good. Because he's already really good at being an introvert. It's right. the extrovert part that he can do better. Because in certain some circumstances, being extroverted is probably better. Same thing for an intro, an extrovert. So you learn to compensate. That helps. So that helps, helps a whole lot. Okay. So learning to compensate. Learning. I mean, but that's assuming a level of emotional intelligence of being aware of where my deficit models might be. Right. So we need some tools, perhaps. Um, your. Well, that's what that's why your charter partners are here. I mean, again, if you hire a young person who's, I don't know, 24 years old, starting his or her life, well, it's natural that they're still developing. Uh, but as you go in the organization, go up, you need to be aware that uh, well, managing is not about the technical aspect. It's also about the capacity to connect with other people, to understand how they feel. So it's becoming a better person. We, and we tell that. I'll, I'll let you go back to your question. We tell that we teach people. We, we teach uh, managers. Uh, we, we have an MBA program. We have a, a strategic business unit management program. We believe this program makes you also a better person. Right. Because without being a better person, you cannot be a better manager. Mm -hmm. You can be more technical, but not necessarily a better manager. All right, forgive me. Well, I'm going to hold these and then I'm going to read out some of the questions in there. So, By all means. Um, so one of them is actually to start with if, if leadership behaviors. So I hate to see a well known for leadership behaviors. What are some of the key behaviors that you teach and how do you develop them? Well, I mean, that the, the first, I mean, the, the idea of tolerance mm -hmm. and the idea of tolerance of diversity. The idea of creating psychological uh, safety spaces, psychological safe spaces. The idea of being able to uh, to listen uh, before you 
the idea of being understanding that you do not jump to solutions when you try to frame the problem. So essentially trying to do that, they're based on, on emotional intelligence skills and those skills that make you better to connect with other people. So what you, what you need to do if you're a leader, you need to create a team because there's no leader without followers. And right. well, I mean, yeah, if you, you need to have the followers and the, you need to organize the followers. Part of the job of the leader is to organize. And for that, they need to have skills that go beyond the normal skills you would expect from a standard person. Okay, so they need to go beyond the skills that you would expect from a normal person. So well, are we extra, extraordinary then? Is that no, what we no. say? Extra, listen, extraordinary means, it means two things. Extraordinary means that something's truly really exceptional. Right. Extraordinary means out of the ordinary. What I'm saying is that most of us, uh, what we like to do is the things that come easy to us. Hmm. You're an extrovert, you want to do things that are extrovert. And the challenge is to talk to someone who's an introvert. So you need to go beyond what is easy and immediate. And that is, in, in that sense, I say extraordinary because it requires effort. Right? To become a leader, to become a manager, an entrepreneur, but you need to be able to actually to connect to other people and that is tough. Mm. That requires a lot of effort. Not everybody's willing, that's okay. But mm. those who do, they need changes in themselves, need to grow as a person. And that is not easy, it's never easy. So, I mean, how, how are you doing that? I mean, in terms of perhaps we're saying becoming a better person is something you've touched on earlier. Some of those traits, looking, not jumping to conclusions, thinking rationally, data analysis. And you've got lots of tools in that. Can you tell me a little bit about what you're doing around coaching and mentoring? That's something interesting. I've seen well, we go back to the uh, to the, uh, the, the the way we start. Uh, uh, leadership is also a practice. Right. The things you do, behaviors. Uh, so what we tend to do is, depending on where you are, we'll put you in a situation in which, in which you have to do things. Right. And the more you do and you reflect about the things you did, you learn. Essentially, it's actual learning. We put you in a situation with a safe situation in which you need to do something. Then you reflect on what you did. You get feedback from people. You, you learn from that and you try to do something else. Uh, now, depending on the level of the problem, you do something different. We, the first thing, the most obvious, is understand who you are, what your strengths and weaknesses are. Uh, because for good or for bad, you cannot be anybody else. It's you are who you are. So I might as well understand really who you are, know what you believe you are, what you think you are, what your mama told you you are. <laughs> and you need to see what you are. And it turns out that uh, sometimes a lot of people are like very, very surprised. Uh, they, many people don't have self-awareness. Uh, yeah. Well, then that, that helps a lot. Now, we tend to get people with more self-awareness because we didn't expect them to be able to yeah. who are already in management. Uh, but say, where, where are you starting from? Who are you? What are your strengths? What are your weaknesses? And now let's work on the things that are not, are not intuitive to you, that are not very good yeah. to you. Okay. So look at those things that perhaps we're not good at good to you and we try to focus you try to well, it's interesting because there's, a, there's a, the opposite view of course is to say that if you've got a Lionel Messi type player what you might do is say he's not great in the air okay he's not the tallest of men and then what we do is we're focusing that whole system is geared up to getting the ball to Messi's feet you're, you're right. developing some certain strengths rather than worrying about the deficit model as such you're right I mean, the metaphor is a good metaphor mm. nevertheless here I think we're talking about something more basic uh, uh, this is not about whether uh, whether uh, uh, Messi can actually jump and, and hit the ball with his head because he's mm. a short man. Mm. This is about whether he can play with left and right foot. So mm. you will tell me, oh, Messi cannot play with his right foot. Well, that's a big problem. See, uh, that's a that's a he can. But we say, oh, I cannot play my left leg. Well, that's a big problem. Right. Uh, so we talk about something more basic here mm. uh, because your personality traits need to overwhelm you, and and then when you overwhelm you, they overwhelm the way you relate to other people, and they are different. They're not right. like you. Hmm. Interesting, because they're not like us, right? So, as you said, we're all individuals within that part. I mean, what do you see? I mean, just this idea of art and science. We've got another question just coming up there saying, um, how much is it really a science in that um, degrees or awarding programs? I don't know what your management degree is in HPC, is a master of science, you know, in many cases, right? How much of a science is management or is HR? Well, we, we started with that. I mean, the, the... People say that management is an art. Uh, people say management is a science. No, it's not really a science. Uh, it's no, only it's an art. It's a practice. It's a practice. Now, what we do is that we don't teach the science of management because there's not really a science for all things, although certain disciplines are much more technical, much more reducible to a set of rules. Uh, but we tend, to, we tend to focus on the practice of management. Now, we teach people who are uh, a lot older, not younger, not people just fresh or Mm -hmm. So these people already can reflect on their experiences that, and, and the idea of the degree, they're going to go to the next layer. So for example, functional manager who wants to get her first uh, C job, 
Right. Right? That's what they do the program. Right. And we try and say, what is different with the C job? So in that sense, I mean, we I think we understand very well what it takes to be successful with the C job. Mm. We teach them that. Um, right. The same thing with a person who's been out for 10 years and now want to go to a, to a much bigger firm or had a responsibility with 10 people and now wants to have a responsibility over 200 people. Mm. So that's that's what we teach. But to answer the question of the of this uh, this writer, uh, I would say that we focus on the practices and we do that through action learning, action orientation. Uh, this is not about management. This is about becoming a better manager. So that means to do things. So we need to practice. So I mean, to become a better manager, we need to do things. So I mean, is that something? I mean, for HR colleagues, is that something we can do in terms of rehearsing with our management team? Can we do scenario planning? Can we start thinking through what if this happened? How we can manage that in a safe situation? So creating that safety. So um, we do. We do one that you're going to enjoy yeah. very much. We do. We we do here at HSC. We have a program in equine leadership. So you have to lead a, a horse. Right, right. Now they're all like uh, all like practical complications. The horses, well, they they're like huge animals. They can yeah. do a lot of damage. They don't understand when you talk. I mean, they don't speak English. So no matter how slow you speak, they don't speak English. And they saw they have also other peculiarities. Right. This is a good way to essentially expose people to how do you manage diversity. Now here you have a horse. You have something to need to get done, and it's you who need to adapt yourself to the horse, not the horse to you. It just doesn't matter what you. The horse will not adapt to you. But if you want to get things done, you need to be able to understand the horse. I mean, some people tell you, some of the teacher they they tell the metaphor. You need to become the horse. I mean, I think it's a little bit overdone. But at the very least, you need to think like the horse. See, so what is the horse? So how does the horse react? What are the things that can motivate the horse or discourage the horse? And now, how do I incorporate the horse into my clients? But it's about you being close to the horse, not the horse being close to you. Well, that's a good way to learn. Now you can teach for, you can make a person read 25 books. The experience of actually having to lead a horse and a horse saying no because I don't care about you, that is super powerful. Yeah, so that's interesting. So that is super powerful, right? So experiential learning is what you're talking about there. So we can teach all we like in terms of communication and body language, but to lead that horse, you need to be delivering that 100% right all of the time. Mm -hmm. Or it's going to do what it does to me, step on my feet, right? Yeah, and, they, and they're not going to move. Right. And they're going to tell you one, one anecdote to, to just to say, I'm not mm -hmm. just critical, it's a personal one. You, you know, the, uh, the uh, old exercise of team building, which you trust the team, you go up a, a flight of, 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 of stairs, a ladder, in fact. Yeah. And then you throw yourself back to the team. Where right. right. well, there you go. <laughs> yeah. Well, I've been with organizing this thing for many years. I've been doing it for two, many, many years. And one day, in one team I was supervising, the, the team say, Oh, well, come on. Please do it, Professor. I was like paralyzed by fear. Right. And I was paralyzed by fear because I didn't trust the team. Yep. Right? So it turns out that it became a, it was so easy for me to tell you, oh, go up the, uh, up the ladder and just uh, throw yourself backwards. Oh, come on, come on. It was so easy for me to tell people to do it. It became a lot more complicated when I had to do it myself. Right. Uh, so uh, that's part, that's what practice uh, kicks in. Yeah, interesting. So practice. Also, for me, there's a joke around consulting people somewhere around there. They, they'll never do it in practice, but they, they will have a look. That's a different thing. So, we've got one here, interesting question saying, We're interested in what we're discussing there. How do you think it affects them, diff shifting demographics such as millennials? Are they more prone to these kind of things as opposed to older people? Are they more open to change? Well, I mean, you thought about that. It's yeah. interesting. It's very difficult to give you a scientific answer. So, I'm just giving you my opinion. No. You can disagree. But what I would hypothesize that if you if you are born in a world with a lot more technological changes, well, you tend to be more used to those that people would live like uh, in fewer technological changes. Now, there is a big debate whether really technologies are accelerating, whether the world is more uncertain, less uncertain. There's a big debate here. But we can we know that the, the technological changes we have seen are quite fast. They're changing a lot. I guess if you're used to that, it becomes normal. Uh, like organizations that are used to innovation, they don't see innovation as a problem. So to answer mm. the, the question in a more like, serious way, I will tell this, this, this person, this man or this woman who's asking the question the following. Uh, in many companies, innovation is very painful. It's a massive disruption. It, as a colleague of mine, and she, she's a professor of uh, innovation, which is one of the world's like, foremost scholars of innovation, she said that innovation for most companies is like passing a kidney stone. It's immensely painful, and you don't want that to ever happen again. Uh, but she she found out in her research that there are companies that innovate very easily. So those innovations are a problem. So I guess that's the whole thing. If you're used to something, it stops being a problem. So I guess maybe, and that is a hypothesis for this, this person, 
uh, maybe the, the millennials are like more used to change because they live with change. Maybe the older people, they live with fewer change and they're, it's more complicated. Although uh, when you talk about the, how the trouble in the world is, I can only think what happened to people who went to World War II mm-hmm. and I say, is it more trouble than that? I'm not sure. Yeah, that's a matter of opinion. In any case, you get used to, uh, to adjusting. Right. Okay, yeah, so you're going to get used to adjusting. So millennials are perhaps more able to adjust, more adaptive. How would you think that would change in terms of organizational structures? But do we need to think differently for millennials, different demographics within our staffing groups? Well, I mean, uh, I think the, uh, for any, every generation that uh, thinks a lot more about quality of life than money, uh, that's a problem. Uh, because they are rethinking the engagement with the organization. Uh, right. Remember that we're not at all, but uh, when we were young, working 25, 30 years for the same company was something standard. Yes. And now it's unusual. Uh, so how do you engage a population of people who like to be saying for two years? Right. Uh, what is it in terms of incentives? What is it in terms of the work that they do? do? And also, why do we, are we keeping the same uh, forms of working that we had so many years ago? I mean, the nine to five was invented at the point in time. It, it, not more with time, it was just invented. Yeah. Uh, why do we have different times? I mean, it's more flexibility. I think that the flexibility is useful, not just for the millennials, it's useful because there are many people who can have a career that's not necessarily nine to five, 40 hours a week. Mm. So how do we engage these people? Many women, uh, young people, so you can work for 10 hours, but not for 20. Why do, what can it be 10 hours? What can it have to be for 40? So that's the idea of Slack, the idea of reconfiguring. Maybe you can have a person for 10 hours. A consultant, maybe even the, she can work from home like two days a week. So for this thing, you need to experiment. Now, some of these are going to fail, but at least you need to try it because some are going to succeed. And if you don't try any, well, you lose the possibility. All right. So looking for possibilities, making sure we don't lose them. And perhaps as we're just coming to the end of time, I mean, there are a couple of other questions that are coming through, but um, I'm just going to give you one more before we do that. But just really to start, start thinking about perhaps how COVID could act as a catalyst for that. Some of the interesting things you were saying there, perhaps working from home changed the way we work. You've mentioned Zooms and Teams and so on. Uh, you know, these are things that might stay with us. So it brings us to the last question is really, what do you think the role of HR is for the future and how we manage these new changing demographics? Well, I mean, the, uh, I hope, I mean, I, I, you know, big, big uh, pandemics, they tend to be a uh, catalyst. Right. They do accelerate changes in the environment. They don't produce things out of the blue, but they accelerate trends in the environment. Um, we're going to see that. Now, the, the, the role of HUC is a role that is becoming a lot more complicated than it used to be, because it used to be just compliance. And now it's not just about, they became compliance and, and, and developing, and now it's compliance, development, and happiness. Uh, so it's becoming more complicated, but, but that's, that's a good thing. Uh, I think the role of uh, uh, engaging people, engaging different types of people, uh, who have different uh, uh, job contracts, uh, who work in different conditions in the organization, who come together uh, to do things and then they, they, they disperse. I think it's, it's a challenge because organizations are going to become a lot more fluid. There's right. sociologists who talk about liquid, uh, mm-hmm. liquid like learning, liquid love, uh, liquid society. And the companies are going to become a lot more liquid. And uh, if they've gone look, it's going to be more complicated to do the traditional HR. So I think it's really positive. It's, it's a very interesting moment. How do we engage with people? How do you train these people? How do you take the best out of these people? What are the new work forms that you can within the legal framework? And that's that's super exciting. Yeah, it's a super exciting time, right? So, okay, so I'm going to wind up. Our, our hour, unfortunately, is up. So thank you very much, Dr. Pablo, for your time, your insights. Thank you for being here. It, it's, it's been an absolute pleasure. So, um, and thank you, everybody, for uh, taking the time. It's been a pleasure being with you. And I hope to see you again. I think um, we'll certainly be having you back for 2021.